This is a 1981 Ferrari 512 BB, better known as the Ferrari Boxer. The Boxer was sold throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, and values have shot up recently to $300,000 to $400,000. This was the coolest Ferrari you could buy 35 years ago, and today I'm going to show you why. I've borrowed this boxer from Tamini Classics here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, and they have an amazing selection of inventory, incredible cars, including a lot of amazing older Ferraris. But I wanted to show you the boxer because it's rare to get up close and personal with this car. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is the fact that these cars are getting more and more valuable, so people are tucking them away inside garages and never driving them. But another is the fact that this car was never sold new in the United States. I'm serious. At the time, Enzo Ferrari didn't want to comply with the myriad of US government regulations, so he told his people, just don't bother selling the boxer over there, and so they didn't. And as a result, this car remains unusually rare in North America to this day. Although, obviously, many people have imported them over the years, and back when this car was new, interestingly enough, there were no restrictions on age of vehicles you could import. So a lot of people bought this car new in Europe and then imported it to the United States even back then, although there was a significant cost in doing this. Now for those of you who need a little refresher on your Ferrari history, here's a little background on the Boxer. The Boxer is the car that came just before the Testarossa. Over about a decade of production, Ferrari built only about 2,300 of these, so this car is really rare. Now like I said before, the official name of this car is the 512. BB, with BB standing for Berlinetta Boxer. Over the years, it's just sort of colloquially been shortened to Boxer. Back here is a 360 horsepower flat V12. It is glorious. And this car was called the Boxer because in a flat engine, the cylinders look like they're boxing when they're firing. Although, strictly speaking, this car has a flat V12 and not a true boxer engine like a Subaru or a Porsche, and yet Ferrari named it like it does have a boxer engine. Oops. Anyway, today I'm going to show you around this car, and I'm going to give you a tour of the coolest Ferrari from 35 years ago. Then I'm going to get behind the wheel and take it out on the road and tell you what it's like to drive the Boxer. And of course, then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Boxer experience, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've written a column about this car, and where I've compiled a list of the coolest V12 Ferrari models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now I'm going to start by simply climbing inside the car, and you're instantly foiled because it's not incredibly obvious how you open the door. There's a keyhole there, but there's no door handle. Well, it turns out right above the keyhole, there's a little vertical black strip. You pull it, and the door opens, which makes sense after it's been explained to you. All right, now I'm inside the boxer, and there is a sea of quirks in here because, well, it was the 70s when this car came out, and ergonomics was not really a major focus for Ferrari. Instead, it was all about the driving experience and the style and the sound. For proof, look no further than the interior door handles. Now, the guys at Tamini Classics put me in this car, and they said, find the interior door handle, and it took me like three minutes. It has nothing to do with this post on the inside of the door panel, and it has nothing to do with those silver things. Those are speakers. The door handle is also not inside the car somewhere, and it's not at the base of this little door pocket. Instead, it's at the top of the door pocket, hidden, unlabeled, and it's this weird sharp lever. You have to know exactly where it is, and then you pull it, and the door opens. Fortunately, although finding the interior door handle is rather difficult, the door panel does have a nice little storage pocket, so kudos to Ferrari for a little practicality. Moving on to the center console, you can't talk about weird ergonomics and not talk about Ferrari's switches. These switches were used in basically every Ferrari of this era. It's this little silver switch with a little black knob on the top, and they're used for everything from the defroster to the fog lights to the choke. By today's standards, these things look very old school. It almost looks like this car is from a completely different world, but this was common with Ferrari at the time. The only exception to the little silver switch with the black knobs was the window switches. Ferrari stole those straight from the Fiat parts bin, and so they decided not to bother making a match all the other switches inside the car. Moving on to the first thing you notice when you sit in the driver's seat of this car, and that would be the footwell. Specifically, you notice that the footwell is quite wide and roomy until you get to the part where you actually have to put your feet. And then, for some reason, it curves in and it steals about half of the entire footwell. This is true in a lot of mid-engine V12 Ferraris, the Testarossa, the 512TR, they're all like this, but this is especially egregious. In fact, the footwell in this car is curved so dramatically that the pedals end up being pushed towards the middle of the car, and so they're offset. 
the accelerator pedal in this car is far to the right of the steering wheel, which makes for a rather interesting driving experience. It really takes some getting used to. Next up, I want to talk about the gauges. Now, the gauges in this car are bright orange, and although they look quite dated today, they were actually ahead of their time. These gauges, to me, look very 80s, even though this car came out in the mid-70s. For I used these orange gauges throughout the 1980s and into the early 90s, so this car is one of the very first, if not the first, to use them. Now, the interesting thing about choosing orange for your gauge color is that then the red line is very difficult to see. Ferrari got around this problem by sticking what looks like a giant red, I don't know, hair comb on the tachometer, and that is where the red line begins. It's a rather odd look, but, well, I guess it works. But that's not the most interesting thing about the gauges. To me, by far the most interesting thing about the gauges is the trip odometer reset dial. Now, for the trip odometer reset, you can just twist it, and then eventually it resets to zero, which is nice, and that's fairly par for the course. That's about how you expect it to be, except you can keep twisting. And then if you want your trip odometer to read 1111 or 2222 or 3333, that's fine. Just keep twisting and twisting. You can even get to 9999 before you go right back to zero. In other words, it doesn't actually zero out. It just goes to whatever repeating number you wish to display. Next up, I want to talk about the glove box. Now, first off, serious kudos to Ferrari for including a lot of storage in this car. I already mentioned the inside of the door panels. There's also a little storage pocket to the left of the steering wheel, which is something you never see in exotic cars from this era. Most of the time, they're just like, yeah, they don't need any storage. Screw them. And not only that, but Ferrari included a glove box. A couple of interesting things about this glove box. Number one is the glove box won't open when the engine is off. That's because the glove box is controlled electronically. And so when you push the glove box opener, nothing happens. So if your car breaks down and maybe you're looking for your owner's manual, which is in your glove box, too bad. It's not coming out of there. Another interesting thing about the glove box is that the glove box is shared with the fuses. This would be absolutely unthinkable in a modern car. No one would ever do this. They hide the fuses, get them completely out of the way so everything looks trim and proper. But this was Ferrari, this was the 70s, and your glove box was shared with your fuses. Deal with it. But once the engine is on, you'll find that the glove box operation is quite nice. Push this little button and it just opens right up automatically for you. Next, we got to talk Ferrari Boxer Sun Visors. Now, the sun visors in this car are pretty standard. They're just sun visors. They open up, they shield you from the sun. There's no mirrors on them, but otherwise, they're not special. Except when you go to put them away, you have to stick them to the ceiling of the car using a button. You push it really hard, and then it buttons in place, and then the sun visor is there. Now, the interesting thing about this is the sun visor would actually stay in place without the button. But I guess Ferrari decided they wanted a redundant method for making sure the sun visor didn't fall in your face. Another interesting, very 70s interior your quirk of this car that I absolutely love. There are dual ashtrays mounted on the floor to the left of the driver and to the right of the passenger, and oh, it gets better. There are even dual cigarette lighters. The driver and passenger have their own cigarette lighters in this car because Ferrari knew their market, and they knew if they sold a supercar in Italy in the 70s, people were going to be smoking in it. I think that's hilarious. It's unthinkable now. Nobody has cigarette lighters in cars anymore, but this thing has two of them. And of course, our final interior item, that would be the horn. I can't do one of these videos of a 70s, 80s Italian exotic car and not point out the ridiculous horn sound. Take a listen. Next, let's talk windshield wipers. Now, at first glance, it looks like there's one big wiper arm and one big windshield wiper, right? Well, that's wrong. There is one big wiper arm, but there are two windshield wipers, which is kind of unusual. One is normal sized, and the other is much, much smaller, and the result is that they can cover basically the entire windshield on their own. Also of note is the fact that there are two spray nozzles washer jets. So there are two wipers and two washer jets, even though it really doesn't look like it at first glance. Another interesting quirk about the wipers, take a look at their normal resting position. It's basically a quarter of the way up the windshield on the passenger side, which if this were a right-hand drive car would mean that the windshield wiper is basically directly in the driver's line of sight. Now when Ferrari converted this car to right-hand drive, do you think they bothered to switch the resting position of the wiper to the other side of the windshield? Mm, nah, I can't believe that they actually would do that. But I'm wrong. I looked it up later and Ferrari did move the wiper on right-hand drive cars, which was no easy task since they would have had to create an entirely new hood for right-hand drive boxers given how the wiper attaches to the car. Maybe Ferrari in the 1970s was more user-friendly than I thought. Nah. Another interesting quirk on the outside of the boxer is the mirror. There's only one exterior mirror on this car. It's mounted on the driver's side, and instead of folding it in when you want to tuck it away, 
you fold it up, which is a nice little touch. And more importantly, you could still use it when it's in this position, only the car is now more aerodynamic. Next up, moving along to the front of the Boxster. Now, one of the things I found out about the Boxster is that a lot of people, casual car enthusiasts, don't even realize this is a separate model from the much more common Ferrari 308, which had way less power and was built in way higher numbers. Now, one way you can easily tell the Boxster apart from any 308 are these turn signals. They are absolutely massive. They're the size of the headlights. They're orange and they're fixed on the front of the car, and only the Boxsters had these turn signals. The 308s never had them. Now, speaking of those headlights, when you turn on the headlights, they pop right up. That's right, this car has pop-up headlights, and indeed you can see that the turn signals are larger than the headlights. I think the car looks kind of cool with the lights up, but of course, it looks even cooler with them down, and the wedge shape is preserved. And since I'm up front, let's talk about the front trunk. Yes, the front space in this car is a trunk. It's not a very big trunk, but you can put stuff in here. And if you open the bottom of the front trunk, you will find that there is a spare tire. I always love these Ferrari spare tires because they're so narrow. There's no way you'd actually want to drive the car any distance with the spare tire on there. The rear tires are probably three times the size of this thing, but that's the spare tire that you get. Now, you can also see a couple of other interesting things inside the front trunk. For example, the windshield washer fluid bag. Yes, that's right, it's a bag in this car. In your car, it's probably a plastic tub, but in this one, they used a bag. This is full of washer fluid, and it squirts out onto the windshield when you're looking to get your windshield cleaned. And of course, we can't talk about the front trunk without talking about the piece itself. It is massive. It's not just one of these little flimsy trunks that pops open and you just lift it up. It is basically the entire front third of this car. All the bodywork comes right off, and basically you can see everything underneath. It totally changes the look of this car when it's open. It's hard to even imagine that you're looking at a Ferrari Boxer, but that's exactly what it is, and that's exactly what's underneath when you open the front panel. However, this isn't quite as impressive as what happens when you open the rear panel, which as you can see is absolutely massive and opening it is no easy feat. First, you pull a little latch located in the door jam and that unlatches it. Then you come around to the engine cover itself, to the top of the engine cover, and there's a little black latch. Push the base of the black latch, it pops up, and then the engine cover is fully unlatched. And then you can open it, although that's easier said than done because this thing is absolutely massive and opening it, therefore, is a two-person job. And take a look at it when it's open. Basically, the entire bodywork for the rear third of the car is off and you can see the car's guts and its chassis and it's kind of a cool look. Also interesting, when the engine cover is open, as it is now, there's a little warning light inside the car that shows you the engine cover is open. You may have seen it in some other shots. That's not a button to pop it, that's a warning light to let you know that it's open and you probably shouldn't be driving. Now having a warning light for your engine cover being open is not that unusual, but the cool thing about it in this car is the warning light has a diagram of the boxer on it, and that is kind of cool. And since we're back here, another interesting boxer quirk, and that would be the turn signals and the brake lights. They're fairly normal for a Ferrari of this era, and that means that when you have the brake lights on and you put on the turn signal, the brake light dims a little bit each time the turn signal flashes. Take a look. I find this very funny. This wasn't something they designed it to do. It wasn't an intentional thing, but it's just sort of the way that the wiring works in these older Ferraris. I've seen it on virtually all of them, and it's funny when you're right behind one, you can clearly see it. So that's a tour of the Ferrari Boxer, and it gives you a pretty good idea of what you could have expected if you were buying one of these new back in 1981. Now back in 81, the sticker price in this car was about $60,000, which translates to about $160,000 in today's money. That's a pretty good deal considering how expensive Ferrari models have gotten today. Anyway, now it's time to really channel the late 1970s and the early 1980s and get this thing out on the road. All right, driving the 512 boxer. Now the first thing I notice is the clutch is really heavy and the pedal situation is just so stupid that it's all the way over there. Real tight in here. Really, really tight in here. In first gear there's barely enough room between my for the for my knee between the steering wheel and the gear lever. Fortunately the brake pedal is angled so there's actually room for my foot to touch the gas without hitting the brake pedal. Otherwise there wouldn't be but shifting is gonna be the problem today. I, I, my, my inner thigh is basically on top of the gear lever. Um, and I'm hitting my knee with every turn of the wheel. So if you're six foot three, six foot four like I am, this is absolutely not the car for you. Uh, this is one of the tighter ones I've driven. Now I'm in second and, and it's a little easier in second, but now we go back to first, which 
hopefully I'll never have to do again. Uh, this thing feels, sitting here at the top of this thing feels smooth. This is, I don't know if all boxers feel this way, I suspect not. I've driven Testarossas, which is the newer car that don't feel this way. Uh, but this one, this one has a nice, nice feeling to it. It feels like a very smooth car. So hopefully this translates to approximate the original driving experience of this car. This is a car you want to make sure to keep moving. The steering is very, very heavy at low speeds. All right, letting it loose. Here it goes. Whoa! Woo! Wow! Wow! That was all the way up to red line, and that was amazing. First off, this car is fast. This car is by no means something that is slow or something that you need to make excuses for. The car is tremendously quick. The steering is great. It's got a go-kart feel to it. It's very heavy at low speeds, but the benefit of that is when you're going around corners at higher speeds, it really feels connected. I love it. That is a blast. The sound is excellent. Really, really good. Amazing sound. The tone and the volume, neither are quite as good as some of the other cars I've driven, but it matches this car when you accelerate. It feels like a vintage Ferrari sound, and I just love it. Very, very impressive. There's a PT Cruiser convertible here in Dubai. People have bad taste everywhere, I guess. All right, we're in a tunnel. Woo! Wow. I really got it going there, and I have to admit, I was probably going a little too fast into that wide sweeping corner, and the handling isn't quite as precise as uh, I was thinking it would be in that situation. Uh, it kind of it got us a little squirrely. This car is very different from a modern car and you got to treat it differently. The steering is very connected but it's not power, you know, there's no assistance. You kind of got to get to know this car before you can really push it. And so I try to be a little bit cautious about that kind of stuff. Now I'm cruising here at a normal speed. I'm going uh, 70 miles an hour which is some speed in kilometers that no one knows. And the car is so stable, it feels really good. This car in the F40 I was very surprised by. They, they, uh, they drive well. I mean, I, I always think that driving a car from this era is going to be a total mess and a disaster and a nightmare. Uh, I could sit in this car and drive for a while. The only problem that I would have is the gear lever on my legs. Uh, it's just a little tight in here. However, the seat is quite comfortable. I'm sitting here, reclined, feels nice. Uh, it's kind of a surprise. Now, of course, I go back into neutral. I'm coming up to a light, and I'm going to downshift into a lower gear, and now the shift lever is back on my leg. There's just no room uh, in this car. It's just crazy how little room there is. I can't believe I'm in Dubai, and I'm sitting at a stoplight next to an EcoBoost Expedition and a lifted Chevy truck. I'm, I'm going to show you this. EcoBoost Expedition, ML63, of course, and there's a lifted Chevy pickup. Uh, oh. What? I flew 12 hours to be in America. All right, now I'm letting it loose again here. Wow! Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it's so good. It's just so good to accelerate. And it feels quite quick. I'm actually surprised by how fast this car is. You start to realize that maybe you shouldn't be whining about the damn gear lever when you have an acceleration moment like that. A man on a 911 Turbo just looked at me. That is envy. Anybody can have a 911 Turbo and they are amazing cars with amazing driving experiences, but this, this is a special car. This is something you don't see every day or ever. This is truly an amazing thing. So that's the 1981 Ferrari 512BB, the Ferrari Boxer. To a casual observer, this car looks a lot like the much more common Ferrari 308, but car enthusiasts know the difference. This car is a lot more special, a lot rarer, and a lot more powerful. And the next time you see a Ferrari Boxer at Cars and Coffee, you will know how to fold up the exterior mirror. Anyway, now it's time for the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Boxer is gorgeous, iconic even, but its design is just a little too close to the 308 to get top marks here, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration is excellent for a car of its day, but by modern standards, its 0-60 to 60 time of 5.6 seconds earns it only a 4 out of 10. Handling is good, steering is pretty nice, and the car does feel like a go-kart, but that's not always a good thing as it can feel unstable until you get to know it, and it earns a 6 out of 10. 
Cool factor is really high as this is a rare and highly valuable Ferrari that not many people get to see and enjoy. It's limited only by the slightly derivative styling and the fact that not many people know what it is, so it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, importance. This car is crucial to Ferrari's history. The first mid-engine V12 and one of the vehicles that helped the brand transition into the modern era and it gets an 8 out of 10. That brings the total weekend score to 34 out of 50, placing it roughly in the middle of the pack. It's largely limited by the fact that it's, well, an older car. Next up are the daily categories, which should be interesting. Starting with features, the Boxer has air conditioning and power windows, but not much more than that. It doesn't even have a passenger mirror. It gets a 2 out of 10. Comfort is abysmal, and I edited out about five minutes of me complaining how tight the interior is in the driving portion. I recognize not all of you are as tall as me, but this is the Doug score after all, and for me this car's driving position is so uncomfortable it wouldn't really work, so it gets a 1 out of 10. Next up is quality, which was decent for the time period, but mediocre by modern standards, and I suspect it isn't cheap to own and maintain this car, so it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is low, with only two seats and presumably bad fuel economy. I don't know the exact figure for the cargo space, but I suspect it isn't good and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, there's value. This is an expensive car, but it's also a special one, and this is one of those vehicles where the value is probably indicative of its cool factor. It gets a 7 out of 10. Add it up, and the total daily score is a mere 16 out of 50, one of the worst yet, but then would you want to drive this car every day? Total it all up and the Doug score is just 50 out of 100. Since the Doug score factors in things like technology, daily drivability, modern performance, you can't expect a vintage car to do very well. But then that's not why you buy it.